Hi, we're going to be talking about preventive health programs for companion animals today. This is chapter 8 in your book. We'll be talking about uh, wellness visits and grooming, uh, d different life stages. We're going to talk also about why we use vaccines um, and uh, what different types of vaccines are, what they have in them, how you're supposed to handle them, and what to look for as far as potential adverse effects. We're also going to be talking about parasitic infections um, and uh, any preventive measures that can be taken. Um, so we want to consider lifelong wellness for our pets. They can, it can help them to live longer. And obviously that is our goal uh, with every pet. There are six life stages in cats. Dogs are similar, but they just have different age ranges depending on their size and breed. So a kitten is uh, considered zero to six months, junior seven months to two years, would be seven to ten years senior would be 11 to 14 years and any, really anywhere uh, 12 and on we might consider geriatric it really depends on the cat for both puppies and kittens we want to see them first at about six to eight weeks of old unless they're having some sort of other issue we're going to examine for what we call congenital abnormalities. These are abnormalities that they are born with. They might be genetic, but sometimes they're just developmental. So we call it congenital. Um, blood tests uh, for kittens at this point, we're going to want to do a feline leukemia FIV test uh, because they can get this disease and, and show the antibodies to this disease, these two diseases, uh, by the time they're six to eight weeks old. Actually, we can do it earlier. As soon as we can get blood, we can do it earlier. We also want to do um, parasite control and immunization, so vaccines uh, and some medication to uh, decrease parasites. Almost all kittens and puppies will have parasites in their system uh, when they're born or shortly after, so um, starting to, to deworm them early on is not unusual. We're going to chart their growth and development. <clears throat> That's particularly fun for um, clients, um, and it also helps us to understand how they're developing. And then education is huge. Um, most of our initial visits, puppy and kitten visits, do last a little bit longer, uh, and most of that time we're doing owner education. Uh, wellness visits are every three to four weeks until they're about 16 weeks of age. And we'll talk about why that timing is uh, shortly. With owner education, these are the topics that are initially or typically discussed during our initial visits. It's a lot of information. We need to talk to them about parasite control, basic husbandry, so manage, ma managing their environment and their social development, um, their food, etc., behavior, training, nutrition, uh, neutering and spaying, exercise, shelter requirements, and then potentially toxic food items. We want to break this up into shorter um, bits and we want to give them go home information as well. It's a lot of information. It's information that you're getting over a year, year's worth, and you're not even getting the whole thing that we might tell a client. But we're trying to set them up to have a really good experience with that pet so that they keep that pet in their household for a long period of time. So we have vaccine schedules. Canine and, and feline vaccine protocols are similar in timing. Um, they may be a little bit uh, different in, uh, in the type of me uh, vaccine that we're giving them. In order to understand vaccine schedules, we have to talk about immunity and how the body deals with um, uh, the, uh, the immune system within the body deals with diseases. So there are two types of immunity, and when the, within those two types, there's natural uh, immunity and artificial immunity. Active immunity is when the body is producing its own antibodies um, against the disease. That's active immunity, the immune system working. Um, we would get an active immunity naturally if we were infected by a certain disease. We get it artificially by vaccinating. Passive immunity is when we're getting antibodies from someplace else. Our, our immune system isn't making them. They're being delivered to us from someplace else. The natural way to get that is through maternal antibodies, through um, nursing uh, and getting the colostrum and, and the um, mother's milk. Uh, the other way is through artificial, through uh, getting a blood transfusion or a plasma transfusion that would have some antibodies in it. So. We have to realize that when we get 
an active immunity, it does take some time for our immune system to kick in and produce uh, what are memory cells so that the next time it sees this infection, it will have a, a response to it. We get an initial vaccination on day zero. We'll see an increase in the antibodies developed by the immune system. But after a certain period of time, around day 10, they'll start to decrease. If we booster them between two and three weeks, so uh, 14 to 21 days, we booster that vaccination, it will increase uh, that those antibody levels uh, to a higher level. It'll come back down again, but it, then if we booster it one more time, um, and every vaccine is going to be a little bit different. We have to go by the manufacturer's recommendations because of the research that they've done. Um, but it's typically, if we need to booster a vaccine, it's going to be every two to three weeks. So if we booster the vaccine, it's going to go up again. It'll go up again and stay up longer uh, the following time. And then we typically will booster every one to three years after that. Um, so that's why we do it. And that's why we call it a boost um, or a booster of vac vaccination. With uh, adults, because they have... Uh, and a mature immune system that's a little bit better at developing immunity to diseases, we typically only have to booster it one time. Adults, uh, dogs and cats, uh, we want to talk about preventive maintenance care. So how do we keep them clean and disease free? Um, we're going to update their history. We would want to do an annual or biannual examination. If we're doing an examination once a year for, uh, for dogs or cats, typically we say that's about six to seven years in humans. Um, a biannual examination would be about doing it every three years um, because they age a little bit quicker than we do. So we have to think about, you know, what, what would you really want for your pet um, to make sure that they're Doing an examination every six months is ideal. You can catch a lot of things before they become a problem. Want to review their vaccines, make sure they're getting just enough vaccines to keep healthy, um, and um, and just check and make sure that they're not going to go anyplace new um, or be around a lot of other pets. We may need to add or subtract vaccines from their schedule. Nutrition, um, we've uh, talked about, or actually we're going to be talking about nutrition in a couple of weeks and how important that is, uh, getting the right food for that pet. Parasite control, uh, they are around parasites uh, more than we are, uh, but we definitely don't want them to bring parasites into the house because the parasites that they can get and give to us can be very dangerous for us. Tests. If we can catch things in the blood, going on in the blood or the urine uh, ahead of time before they're showing signs, we can actually um, create a situation in which they're not going to have that disease. And then really importantly, it's dental health. So we can talk about how they can care for the um, the health of the, of the teeth at home, but it's really important that we do at least a yearly dental um Prophy or prophylaxis, where we're actually scraping the teeth and polishing the teeth. And this has to be done under anesthesia, which can be a little bit scary for owners, but it's actually more important that they get their teeth cleaned. Um, if we have the proper anesthesia protocol, that's a little less scary uh, than actually having the diseases that we can get from poor dental care. Senior and geriatric animal wellness, um, we have to remember their lifespans. Cats typically live a little bit longer, so senior between 11 to 14 years. Geriatric really kind of overlaps. It really depends on the health of the pet. And, and to be honest, the health of the pet really depends on their lifelong dental care. So that's where dental care comes in. Um, dog lifespans, we have a wide variety in the lifespan. Um, we'll consider them seniors in the last 25% of their predicted lifespan. Uh, wellness checks every six months for seniors um, should be, uh, without a doubt, by the time they're a senior, we should be seeing them at least every six months. If they have a chronic condition or on chronic medication, we want to, may want to see them uh, more frequently. Grooming is a really important part of taking care of a pet. And if people are unable to properly groom their uh, pets, we have a lot of problems. So we want to be able to talk about um, bathing procedures, um, you know, keeping the ears clean, uh, cleaning and drying them out after a bath to avoid ear infections, uh, making sure that people know how to clean ears uh, properly, um, 
removing any discharges from any orifice uh, and, and noting those and making sure that w if they need to be seen, that we're seeing them. Removing matted hair. A, a cat should never look like this. A dog should never look like this. Uh, making sure we get to those mats um, before they cause a problem. Nail trimming is very, um, you know, a lot of people don't think about it, but it's very important that we do nail trimming. It actually changes the way the bones are so uh, supposed to look they're supposed to look like this and with a long nail it really changes the structure of the bone it can be very painful for these dogs to walk um, so we want to really pay attention to uh, getting those nails back to a normal position uh, as much as possible so we want to talk about all of those things when should you bring your pet in what can you do at home um, to save money and to increase the bond with your pet um, small animal immunity, uh, we talked about what difference between passive and active immunity. Passive immunity is short-lived. Um, we do have to be careful about when we give vaccines, though, because when they have maternal antibodies in their system, uh, they're not really developing their own antibodies. So at about five weeks of age or younger, they have maternal antibodies that they've gotten from the colostrum. Um, and if they've got that, we can't give vaccines uh, because the, the, the maternal antibodies will actually fight those the, the infection in the vaccines and they won't, and the vaccines won't work. So we, that's why we started about six to eight weeks, um, not any time before that. Uh, another way to give um, some brief immunity would be through an IV infusion of antibody-rich plasma. It's one of the reasons we would give plasma to a, a dog with parvo because their immune system is severely suppressed when they have that virus. So if we can give them a passive immunity just to get them over the hump, that can be very helpful. Um, active immunity with um, it's when you have antigens, you develop antibodies to those antigens. Um, we can vaccinate or the animal can go through the infection. We use vaccination because it, it is more controlled and they have less of a reaction to it. Um, so we're going to vaccinate puppies and kittens every three to four weeks until they're 16 weeks of age and it develops an immunologic memory. There are a number of different vaccine types and uh, we need to understand the difference between them. So not all vaccines are created the same way. There are non-infectious vaccines. These are whole or killed pathogens or subunits that are unable to cause the disease. Um, some disadvantages are that the antigen may be inadequate to, um, to boost, to uh, have a, res a resulting immune effect. So sometimes we uh, add what we're called adjuvants to the vaccine in order to boost the immune result. Some um, non-infectious vaccine example, uh, one would be rabies. Obviously, if we gave um, an active or infectious uh, case of rabies, the animal would die. So we would use a non-infectious vaccine like rabies to cause this. The, the problem is that in order to boost their um, their response, their immune response to the disease, we have to add adjuvants. And so adjuvants, is, are, those are the things that actually cause the most problems with hypersensitivity or a vaccine reaction in a pet. Rabies is one of the, um, the uh, vaccines that is most likely to cause a hypersensitivity or vaccine reaction. Some infectious vaccines um, are things where the pathogens are altered, so they don't cause the disease, but they still infect the host cells to stimulate immunity. Um, the advantage is that they stimulate immunity more naturally and efficaciously, but because they have a little bit of the disease in them, the animal can have a small reaction and a, a small immune reaction to that and get a little bit of that disease. One example would be bor the Bordetella vaccine. They can get a really small case of Bordetella and cough a little bit, um, but usually it's gone within three days. With vaccines, it's really important to follow manufacturer's directions. Uh, you need to, a lot of vaccines need to be refrigerated, need to be refrigerated properly and right away. We can't just leave them in a box and then you know later put them in the fridge. It will um, either increase their hypersensitivity reaction to the disease or decrease the efficacy of the vaccines. Either way, it's bad. We also can't freeze it. If we freeze it and then thaw it, that will also be a problem. Most 
powders, which means we have um, a powder that we have to add a fluid to, and we call that reconstitution. Um, this is a video on how to properly reconstitute a vaccine. This is a clinical skill uh, that you will be evaluated on if you do get into the program. So it's really important that you're able to follow these instructions and do it properly. So you, you have to use the diluent that's provided by the manufacturer. Often that diluent, it has more than just sterile water in it. It has the adjuvant or it has additives to it to, to, uh, to provide the proper amount of immunity or to decrease any contaminants uh, within the powder. We want to put the proper amount in, mix it gently, and then we want to administer it within the hour. Once it's mixed, it needs to be administered. So when we administer vaccines, it's really important that we document. We need to know that they've gotten it. Um, typically, the quantity of the vaccine um, is one mil, um, although they are starting to decrease it to a half a mil um, because it tends to work uh, with less uh, hypersensitivity reactions. But you have to go by the manufacturer's recommendation. If you don't go by the manufacturer's re recommendation, the vaccine is not going to work well. I have heard stories of veterinarians dividing this into smaller amounts for smaller animals. This is not appropriate. You do need to give the manufacturer's recommended amount to the pet. There's no research that shows that dividing it into smaller amounts is effective. Um, it may cause less of a reaction in smaller pets, but honestly, um, it al also probably causes less, confers less immunity. So it's not appropriate to divide it into smaller amounts. Roots of administration. Um, location is really important. Um, most vaccines are given under the skin or subcutaneous. There are a few that are labeled to give IM or intramuscularly. There is one type of vaccine that is given transdermally or in between the layers of the skin, and that's the canine melanoma one. There are also intranasal and intraoral vaccines, and these are manufactured very specifically to go into those locations. You do need to look at the bottle or the packaging information to know where each vaccine goes. Intraoral, there are some uh, kitty vaccines that are intraoral, which are really helpful. Uh, Bordetella vaccine uh, is an intranasal one, uh, but not all Bordetella vaccines are intranasal. So it's really important to know wh which one you're dealing with. We have vaccines that are core versus non-core. And what we're doing is we're following um, the American Association of Feline Practitioners, or AAFP, or American Association of Ho uh, American Animal Hospital Association guidelines, or uh, guidelines, or AHA guidelines. Um, so we need to assess each animal for vaccination um, and then design an individual protocol. Core vaccines are what we call um, uh, necessary for all animals, and we'll talk about each uh, core vaccine for uh, each animal. Non-core are elective vaccines that may not be necessary for all animals, but indicated in some situations. And there are some vaccines that are just not recommended at all. So some different situations would be if the animal is kenneled, groomed a lot, uh, goes into different areas of the country that may have um, uh, different um, diseases, etc. Um, onset and duration of immunity will de be dependent on the um, animal. It will be dependent on the vaccine, uh, and it will de be dependent on legal recommendations as well. We need to boost your vaccines, first of all, based on the manufacturer's recommendations. Um, they've done the research that shows where we have, uh, how long that immunity will be conferred for that uh, vaccine, and but we have to realize there may be individual um, changes uh, with each pet. But the manufacturer's recommendations stand for every pet, and so they guarantee it if you're doing it uh, based on their recommendations. There are also established frequency guidelines by um, AHA and AAFP as well. Some cat immunizations. The core vaccines are rabies and distemper, feline distemper. Um, the feline distemper is not actually distemper, um, and you do need to know what the combination means. FVRCP stands for feline viral rhinotracheitis, which is an upper respiratory disease. 
herpes and is um, a herpes virus. Um, Khaleesi virus, so that's FVR, Khaleesi virus, and panleukopenia virus. Panleukopenia virus is very similar to dog parvovirus in terms of the uh, anti, um, antibody that it produces, um, but it does cause slightly different signs. So we have um, feline viral rhinotracheitis, Khaleesi virus, and panleukopenia is in, um, all into the in this multivalent or multi a combination vaccine called FVRCP. So rabies and FVRCP. Some non-core vaccines, if the animal is an indoor-outdoor cat or has access to uh, cats that are indoor-outdoor cats uh, or is boarding um, or is in a, in a, a facility that has lots of cats. Um, feline leukemia virus, feline immunodeficiency virus, chlamydophila, uh, fe uh, chlamydophila filis, Bordetella bronchoseptica, um, feline coronavirus. Um, they do get a SARS or FIP. Uh, it's called feline infectious peritonitis. Um, and then Giardia lamblia, which to be honest, we don't give Giardia much anymore. It's not very effective. The rabies vaccination in cats. Um, rabies is caused by a rhabdovirus and it affects the nervous system. Uh, so any nervous system um, signs that we see in a cat, we have to think rabies. And kittens um, are very commonly, are one of the ways that we are most um, infected with rabies as a profession. Um, it is a reportable disease. So if you have an animal that you suspect has rabies, you do need to report it to the uh, state um, government, the USDA. Uh, we want to monitor local and regional requirements. This is a legal um requirement for all cats that they get a rabies vaccination once a year. It is a core vaccine. We do want to give this and every vaccine very low on the right rear of the cat. And this is important. You have to remember the locations that we give vaccines. The reason that we give these vaccines, vaccines in a very specific area is that cats are prone to getting uh, what's called a fibrosarcoma, which is a tumor and is very fast growing and it, and it invades surrounding tissue quite a bit. And once they get this fibrosarcoma, often that is a death sentence. In order to remove the fibrosarcoma, we have to get at least this far around the mass, which is several centimeters around the mass, uh, and we have to get that deep into the tissue. Um, for an animal where you're trying to get it off the hip or between the shoulder blades, it's almost impossible to get the entire mass out. So if we give it low, we could potentially just amputate the leg and remove the cancer. Um, we will also sometimes, in some cases, give vaccines in the tip of the tail. For right now, it's given in the right rear. This is what a kitten with feline viral rhinotracheitis or Khaleesi virus looks like. It's an upper respiratory virus that causes lots of um, eye discharge, nasal discharge, uh, ulcers around the uh, lips and in the mouth. Um, so these cause respiratory diseases. There are different strains. We can make different vaccine uh, choices. Um, we have to sometimes assess the risk for Khaleesi virus. We don't always have to give Khaleesi virus, but often that is included in the FVRCP. Panleukopenia. This is what we call feline distemper, but it's not exactly like feline distemper. It is caused by a parvovirus. So we could get a parvovirus positive um, uh, if we used a parvovirus test on these cats. So panleukopenia can cause fever, lethargy, anorexia, dehydration, vomiting, diarrhea, and I've seen sudden death. Um, so we had a couple of kittens that were, uh, I worked in a Banfield, uh, which was in a PetSmart. We had a Humane Society or some, some group uh, brought in their cats, kittens for adoption. The kittens were perfectly normal, seemed maybe a little lethargic the night before. Um, they came in the next morning to take care of the kittens and they were dead. And they turned out to be positive for parvo, a parvovirus. Uh, it was panleukopenia. Um, so this is something that is part of the core vaccines. Um, again, we want to be really careful about where we give it. So on the right rear, 
we're going to, and this is the picture of a cat, and you can tell that this cat is lying on its stomach because you don't see any nipples here, okay? So right rear is rabies, right front is FVRCP, left front is feline leukemia, or FIV, any of the non-core uh, vaccines like that. We might also give it in the left front, but these are the three main areas, and we want to give it low, as low as possible. So below the stifle, below the elbow, as much as possible. Um, leukemia vaccine, when we talk about pathogenesis, how do they get the disease versus FIV? Leukemia um, vaccine is given uh, from cat to cat through uh, discharges, oral, nasal discharges, urine, feces, um, the sharing the same litter box, if they're sh sharing the same um, food bowl, fomites, what we call fomites, these are uh, articles of clothing or food bowls or toys that can be passed along through that. So it is actually very contagious. Contagious. If you have a cat that sits at the windows, open window and you have a window screen, you have an outside cat, it's possible for your indoor only cat to get leukemia. Um, so that is a, a dangerous disease uh, and it causes um, uh, low, uh, lower immune system and eventually cancers and, and death. Um, FIV is different. FIV is only, it's a feline immunodeficiency virus, so it's very similar to um, human aids. Uh, it's only given through bite, bites and scratches. So FIV can, uh, an animal with FIV does not necessarily pass it on to other um, critters unless it's a fighting cat. Um, but it will also lower the immune system and uh, the animal, any, any uh, infection that the animal gets could potentially kill it. So these are non-core vaccines if you have an animal that doesn't have access to the outside or outside cats. Uh, but it is a core vaccine for those animals that are, do have access to outside cats. Uh, we want to test them before we vaccinate them. So we want to do a leukemia and FIV test. Um, we do not want to give extra vaccines to any animal that might have leukemia or FIV because their immune system can't handle it. If we do an FIV vaccine, every time they are tested thereafter, they will test positive for FIV. So once we give the vaccination, they are going to test positive, and that could be a death sentence for some cats. So we want to be really careful. Even though they don't actually have it, we can't tell whether they have it or they've been vaccinated for it. So we want to put a, a chip in those cats, so they get an identity chip for cats receiving FIV, and give the uh, owner a card so that they can identify the animal as having received that vaccination. The, there are tests. These are called SNAP tests. They're ELISA tests or um, enzyme-linked immuno um, assay tests and uh, those these tests we get a little bit of blood uh, four drops of blood and three drops of a blue re I'm sorry three drops of blood and flu four drops of a blue reagent uh, put it into this well um, it tra the liquid travels up we snap it down it crushes an ampule of reagent that comes uh, back down and if the animal has antibodies um, to uh, either leukemia or FIV it's going to color a dot some other non-core elective vaccines for cats includes chlamydia, bordetella, uh, which we would want to give to cats that are in boarding or grooming situations or in a, a large cattery, um, or feline coronavirus, which causes um, nodules. There's a dry form and a wet form, either nodules or the chest form like we, we're seeing in um, humans where we get a lot of fluid in the chest, um, and then feline giardia vaccine, uh, which is not given as much. It's not as effective. So usually just treat giardia. These are the uh, injection-related sarcomas or fibrosarcomas that we see in cats, usually associated with rabies and leukemia vaccines, um, but it can be associated with any injection if you have a cat that is genetically susceptible to it. Uh, so we have to be very careful anytime we give an injection site. It used to be that we always gave an injection uh, between the shoulder blades. That's not done anymore. We want to give it low on extremities as much as possible. Um, so pathology, we want to do a, um, a biopsy of this and see what it is and then document this and report it to the manufacturer because we're trying to decide exactly what is causing uh, this fibrosarcoma. It could be something within the vaccine, not the vaccine itself. 
sometimes they will get little reactions at the injection site that are not fibrosarcomas. It's just an immune reaction that causes inflammation, causes a little scar tissue, and it will go down after a week or two weeks. So our recommendations, if we're going to biopsy, we want to biopsy as quickly as possible, but we have this one, two, three rule, rule for biopsy or removal. If it grows um, more than uh, one uh, centimeter, um, in a short period of time, if it lasts or does not start to decrease after two weeks, um, and if it is um, it grows three times the size in a short period of time, it's something like for biopsy or removal. So we're looking for constant growth um, and quick growth. And if we're seeing that, that's a problem. All right, moving on to dog immunizations. Um, Core vaccines for dogs are rabies, canine distemper virus, canine uh, uh, hepatitis, or canine, it's called um, the, the dis, uh, vaccine that we give is adenovirus type 2, canine parvovirus type 2. So um, it's DAP or DHP, um, distemper hepatitis parvo. Um, we uh, have also parainfluenza, which is often in, in, included, so you may see DHPP um, as a core vaccine. Uh, the other thing that will be added into that vaccine would be leptospirosis, and that's in our non-core um, vaccine, but this is something that I do believe is should be on the core side. Now, the problem with leptospirosis is that we don't test enough for it, and it's just like with the coronavirus, if we don't test it, we can't say whether it's here or not. So with a leptospirosis, if we don't test it, we don't know if it's in the area. But we have seen several cases of it in the area. The problem with leptospirosis is that it is something that humans can get fairly easily from their pets, and it can cause kidney failure in humans. So it is something that I believe it should be a core vaccine, and I'm not alone in that. A lot of people do believe it should be a core vaccine. Right now, it's still in the non-core in this area. One of the issues with leptospirosis uh, was that there was a uh, research study that was done uh, now about 40 to 50 years ago that a lot of breeders um, saw in which 30 pets were vaccinated with leptospirosis and had a vaccine reaction. And in some cases, the pets died. The problem is that the study wasn't um, accurate or correct, but it got into the breeding um, history. And so a lot of breeders will say, don't give leptospirosis, this animal will die from it. And that's just not the case. Um, your animal is much more likely to have a, a reaction to rabies um, than to leptospirosis. But if there is a concern, we can separate that leptospirosis uh, vaccine from the combination and give it separately at a separate time so that if they do have a reaction, it's not going to be a reaction to everything that they've gotten. So I do recommend having parainfluenza and leptospirosis in your distemper vaccine, which would then make it DHPPL or DLHPP, something like that. But it's going to have distemper, hepatitis, parvovirus, parainfluenza, and leptospirosis. Bordetella bronchoseptica, that is kennel cough. If the animal is around other uh, dogs and they're barking in their face or coughing in their face, they could get kennel cough. And we see this most often in grooming facilities, in boarding facilities, at dog parks, etc. So if your dog is around a lot of other dogs, we do recommend it. Borrelia burgdorferi is Lyme disease, and we do have Lyme disease in this area. And so I do recommend and I do get my uh, animals vaccinated for Lyme disease. Lyme Lyme disease is um, transmitted by ticks, and so if you have ticks in your area, I would definitely recommend it for your dog. Canine influenza is uh, pretty commonly in this area. Any animal that should be um, boarded or will be boarded should have canine influenza as well. Canine coronavirus is something we might give to puppies. It's typically um, a virus that uh, when it affects dogs, only affects them when they're puppies, and they develop a, an immune uh, response to it and uh, an immunity to it. So we don't typically see that as a problem later on. So our rabies vaccine, again, is caused by a rhabdovirus. Um, they usually get nervous system uh, symptoms. It is a reportable disease. Uh, we have to look at local and regional requirements uh, for how often we give it. So this is not based on necessarily um, 
manufacturer recommendation, but actually legal recommendation. So depending on your county, it, you may have to give it um, every two years or every three years. Um, after the initial uh, vaccine, you do have to do a booster in one year, and then it's um, every two to three years after that. Um, our body does not like the rhabdovirus, so it does develop a really good immune reaction to it. Um, one other thing about rabies, there's a lot of uh, legal recommendations around rabies vaccines because it's so deadly to humans, and that is we cannot give a rabies vaccination to an animal that has bitten uh, a person within the last 10 days, and we cannot give a rabies vaccine vaccine um, to animals that it's not approved for. So wolf hybrids are typically not allowed to get rabies vaccinations. Canine distemper vaccine is caused by a paramyxovirus that's like measles. Um, it causes respiratory and nervous system symptoms. It's nearly been wiped out, um, but not entirely. Um, the more people get distemper vaccine, or the more pets that uh, get it, the more likely we are to wipe this disease out. It is a core vaccine. Um, we can give, if necessary, a measles vaccination, human measles vaccination. It does um, provide a temporary immunity. Parvovirus. I'm sure most of you have heard of parvovirus. Uh, it is path, passed along through uh, urine, feces, um, uh, etc. Uh, any fluids uh, coming from the animal um, and uh, puppies are more likely to get it than adults, especially those that uh, have not been vaccinated or have only had a couple of vaccines. Um, it uh, we do see some virus shedding after vaccination. So after about a week or so after va vaccination, we do not want them around dogs that are susceptible. There are some breeds that are more susceptible to um, parvovirus than other breeds. And those include Dobermans and Rottweilers. Even labs and beagles can be more susceptible to parvovirus. Um, uh, so they actually need to be vaccinated up to 16 weeks of age. Otherwise, um, they, they tend to get it. Parainfluenza is part of the kennel cough complex. It's really a non-core vaccine, but it's almost always included. So you see that D um, adenovirus 2 or hepatitis PP, parainfluenza parvovirus. Um, so it's in, usually included in that. Again, leptospirosis, it is, um, we are not necessarily considered an endemic area, although we are becoming. So red, um, orange, those are endemic increases here, um, we do have a probability of leptospirosis. So I, I do highly recommend getting it. Leptospirosis is a disease typically carried by rodents, um, and they urinate everywhere, and so that's how it's passed along. Um, there, uh, like I said, there was a study, it's now nearly 50 years ago, it was debunked, but that one study has changed the whole course of vaccine history. Um, so, it, and, and it was it's just saying that there were too many adverse reactions. We just aren't seeing that. It is a zoonotic disease, so I do highly recommend that it's part of your um, protocol. Bordetella bronchoseptica is part of the kennel cough complex, and when we say complex, it means a lot of diseases work together to cause this um, kennel cough. It is a non-core vaccine, but um, you do want to give it if you have Give it intranasal, um, uh, will give local and systemic immunity. There's an injection if you have an animal who can't get near their mouth. Um, there's also intraoral as well. Borrelia burgdorferi is the um, Lyme disease. This is the 2017 forecast, um, so this is a little bit old. Uh, I guarantee if we look it up now that Lyme disease will be covering most of um, Ohio as well. Um, this is, like I said, um, you see these little deer ticks, but they are, it is passed along by other ticks as well. Canine influenza, really be very careful around other dogs, especially at dog parks. Um, they, it is something that can be passed around. And then this is an example of a puppy with coronavirus, um, parvovirus, um, but it's something that uh, once we get them over this, they typically have immunity to it. Um, and a lot of these guys don't get this sick, they just develop immunity to it. Adverse vaccine events, we do want to warn clients and um, give them instructions on what to do and when to call us. Um, we do have to be careful of anaphylaxis. Anaphylaxis is when you have an overall body system shutdown um, of uh, the um, 
of, of the whole body. So the, the kidneys will shut down, uh, be unable to breathe. Um, it's, it's a severe inflammatory response, uh, and we have to be very careful of that. The um, problem is that um, a lot of times what we'll see is just a little bit of facial swelling or swelling at the site of the injection. Um, those adverse effects can can be the immune system actually giving you a warning that the next time you give the vaccine, it's possible that they could have an anaphylactic reaction. So they it, the, those adverse effects tend to build uh, at each time you give vaccines. Um, if we do see an adverse uh, event like facial swelling, swelling around the eyes, swelling around the neck, um, swelling at the site of injection, we are supposed to report that to the manufacturer and also to the USDA. And there's a link here um, that shows you how to report that. Um, we can also see a delayed hypersensitivity reaction where in three days they actually have a reaction to the vaccine. There are predispositions positions to adverse reactions, it does tend to be genetic. Um, so if they're going to react to something, it's not necessarily anything you did. It's the fact that they're going to react to something. Um, they're usually tip typically pretty rare. And as long as we are protecting the animal against future events, that's what we want to try to do because the risk of the um, adverse event, event is much less than the risk of getting the disease. So we want to give the vaccine, but if we can protect them by giving them a Benadryl injection, giving them some steroids ahead of time, and just watching them very closely, that's usually the best thing to do. Parasite prevention. So how do we do routine screening? Well, we get fecal um, samples. So we just need a little small fecal sample to check for eggs um, and, and larvae and the feces. Uh, typically looking for eggs. Um, the other way is to test for heartworm disease or in, um, blood parasites uh, by getting a blood sample. Um, most puppies and kittens will be born with roundworm or will get roundworm from their mom when they nurse. Uh, and so typically we will uh, deworm them at least twice starting at about six to eight weeks of age and then two to three weeks later. Older dogs and cats can get um, uh, parasites as well, and we typically see um, whipworms or uh, tapeworms with these guys, and we want to treat them appropriately. Obviously, external parasite control is really important. Those are the parasites that owners can see, uh, and so we want to make sure that um, that you understand, you know, the, the products that are available uh, for that. I have a chart here for oral treatments for active infestations. We have to remember that these are when we see the eggs or the worms in the stool. Uh, we need to get rid of them, and it takes several doses uh, typically to get rid of um, worms. One dose for tapeworms typically, but uh, other worms it takes two to three um, doses. Um, we can give them heartworm uh, medication that contains enough uh, anti-parasite medication to uh, to keep them, prevent them from getting parasites. So that's another reason we might give heartworm or even some flea and tick products is to prevent them from getting infested with internal parasites. But if they do have an active infestation, we do need to treat them with specific medication. Um, so you will see that uh, there are several things that treat tapeworms, but a lot of things that treat tapeworms don't treat other things uh, unless they're combined uh, with other things. And so it's really important that you take a look uh, through these oral treatments that are available and see what they treat. Do they treat um, whipworms, roundworms, hookworms, uh, tape, tapeworms, and are they for dogs or cats or both? If you see something that's just for dogs, it's uh, potential that it may um, be harmful for a cat. If you see something that's just for cats, it means it's not going to work for a dog. For horses, oh, the, the uh, last thing I want to say is you do have an assignment, um, a heartworm flea and tick assignment. What I want you to do is look at either the product that you're using. Um, the assignment is there for you in the course shell. Um, look at the product that you're using for your own pet. Uh, describe what the active ingredient is. How does it work? How do you apply it? Um, uh, just th there are specific questions I want you to answer and then share that. Enough people use enough different products that we usually get a pretty good idea of who's using what. 
right, moving on to horses and livestock. We're going to talk about how do we do a preventive health problem, program for horses, starting with that horses. Um, it can be specific for an individual or it can be for the whole herd. There are some uh, variables to each program, and it has to do with expected exposures. You're not going to have the same exposure to diseases in a herd of animals that isn't around um, lots of other horses. So if you don't have lots of horses coming in and out of the barn, if you're not taking your horse to shows, you're going to have limited depend on management styles within the barn, the veterinarian's personal preferences, and the owner's personal preferences. I do have a seasonal guide uh, to preventive care in horses uh, that you can see in box 8 one in your text. Definitely recommend that you take a look at that and get a basic understanding of what um, you would be doing each season for so physical examination is super important. Anytime you get a new addition to your stable or herd, or at least once a year, you want to do a physical examination of that horse. Um, the first test that we want to do, even before they arrive uh, within your barn, and at least yearly after that, especially if you're taking the horse um, off property, would be a Coggins test. That Coggins test is a test for equine infectious anemia. It's a blood test, and it is something that is a, it's a reportable disease, so it's something that goes through the state labs um, and something that needs to be reported if they do come back positive for that. Um, once you have brought an animal into your uh, barn, you want to quarantine them for one month and do a physical evaluation after that or during that period if to address any signs of illness or parasite infection. If you have a young horse or you have a horse that doesn't, we don't know the vaccine history, we want to give them an initial immunization and then we boosted them in four weeks, so a month later. Vaccines for horses, they vary in schedule. We have tables in your book, 8.5 and 8.6, that tells you what those um, scheduling is. It will depend on the age of the horse and their anticipated exposure to organisms and also the duration of immunity provided by the vaccine. Some vaccines are good for six months, some for a year, some a little bit longer. We do have to be care careful about anaphylactoid reactions. They can also get reactions. It tends to be, again, a genetic thing, um, although could be immune uh, issue with, for an individual horse. Some, uh, some other uh, complications uh, with vaccines, if you're not cleaning the area first, you might get infection, inject infection into the animal. Um, you do want to inject into the muscle, not into a, a blood vessel. We typically are not doing sub-Q. We're doing IM injections. Uh, you don't want to hit a, a nerve, um, and you do want to be careful how you inject it. Um, most of the vaccines we're giving are given are called polyvalent vaccines, so much like the distemper, hepatitis, parainfluenza, uh, parvo, or the FVRCP, they are uh, vaccines that contain a number of um, uh, different diseases. Common ones would be uh, when we say a five-way or a three-way, and they all have tetanus um, included in them. Uh, horses are pretty prone to tetanus. Um, the bacteria. That, that causes tetanus, uh, which is a stiffening of all the muscles, uh, is um, everywhere in the environment, in their environment. So if they get a scratch, it's possible for them to get um, that bacteria into their bloodstream and, and cause um, produce toxins that cause the tetanus uh, disease. Five-way has to do with the other vaccines that are included. Um, there are quite a few uh, encephalitis uh, uh, or... Um, Neuro, nervous system infections uh, that are given by biting insects, and since horses are around biting insects all the time, um, those are often included. Uh, also, some flu-type um, uh, viruses that are pretty common in the area. Tetanus vaccines. Um, so tetanus is produced by a bacteria called Clostridium tetani, and it produces toxins. That toxin um, it causes the disease and it causes this sawhorse stance and you can see it more often in foals than we do in um, larger the adult animals because they typically have some sort of immunity. Um, so they will go into this rigid stance, their muscles will get super um, uh, cramped and hard, it's very painful, they can't eat or drink when they're in this um, and it takes a lot of work to get them uh, through this illness. Um, there are two types of vaccines, although the tetanus antitoxin is not available, uh, has not been available as much since um, 
2011, um, uh, 2001, which is weird, but it, it we are not seeing it as much uh, available. The tetanus toxoid is a um, toxoid means like uh, the tech toxin. It's a purified inactivated toxin of Clostridium tetani. It is a vaccine um, and is something that would need to be boosted in a young animal, but then we give it typically about once a year. Um, the tetanus antitoxin would be if we have an animal that has a scratch and, and it's been a while since they've gotten the tetanus toxoid or the vaccine. Um, it's produced by hyper, hyper immunization, so giving lots of vaccines to a donor horse, and then we take the uh, serum from that donor horse and produce this antitoxin. The problem is we cannot give these two things together, so you have to use one or the other because the antitoxin will kill the toxoid, and, and so they won't have a long um, immunity uh, to this uh, disease. Now, if we have the toxoid, we can give the toxoid. It won't, if they have the disease, they won't necessarily um, we won't be able to kill the toxin with the toxoid. It will help have the immunity, uh, immune system work on the disease versus the antitoxin itself. So they think of the antitoxin kind of as a um, antidote uh, to the disease. So some common vaccines uh, uh, for her, uh, horses. The encephalomyelitis, there are a number of different types. Um, they, they are named for where they originated. There's Eastern, Western, Venezuelan. There's also West Nile. Um, usually we see it Eastern, Western, and Venezuelan um, put together in a trivalent vaccine. Um, we use it throughout the United States because it's really spread throughout the United States. The active immunizations are made from an inactivated virus. Um, we want to give vaccines before biting season, so typically in the spring. They usually last about six to eight months, um, which is as long as we typically have biting insects. But if you have a warmer season, you may need to um, give it uh, again in six to eight months. Equine herpes virus, it's a, um, there are a couple of different herpes viruses that, that uh, different strains. There's EHV1 and EHV4. Um, there are different vaccine forms. They can be given as modified live vaccines. So it's an, a live vaccine that is modified, so it doesn't cause as much of the disease. Um, we have to be very careful uh, uh, with this disease when we're giving it to pregnant animals. Um, the herpes virus is uh, does cause respiratory and abortion. Um, so if we have an, uh, a pregnant animal, we want to give an inactivated uh, disease. Immunity is short-lived, so any high-risk animals should be vaccinated every six months. If we give it in the spring during the show season, and we're keeping them pretty quiet and isolated in a barn uh, or in your own herd, uh, after that, you can give it just in the spring. Equine influenza is viral and highly contagious, so if you have an animal that um, is around any other horses uh, that might be in, in the show arena um, or traveling, you will want to give flu vaccine as well. Uh, we want to booster every six months if they're at high risk, which means they're traveling quite a bit and going to different shows. Strangles is a disease caused by Streptococcus equi, so it's a strep throat basically, but what it does is it causes severe swelling and in infection or an immune response to the lymph nodes and actually can strangle the horse uh, by causing really, really enlarged lymph nodes, and these will abscess out. Uh, they'll get so big they abscess out. Um, so we, um, if we do have strangles in the area, you have an animal moving from barn to barn, um, there is a vaccine available. There are some side effects that we have to be careful of with the vaccine because it is a vaccine of a bacteria. And any time you give a, a vaccine of bacteria, it can cause um, an immune, a severe immune response. Um, if they are having trouble breathing, they're being strangled by severe swelling in the neck, um, a tracheostomy is often performed to um, allow them uh, to breathe. This is a highly, just like strep throat, it's a highly contagious disease, and if you, it's reportable. If you have strangles in your barn, it will shut down your barn. So some other non-core vaccines, um, equine. Uh, it is something that is a sexually transmitted disease, typically. Um, and, but it can also be passed by a biting fly. Potomac horse fever, um, we have had cases in the area, but we're not sure that the efficacy of the vaccine uh, is uh, very good. 
Botulism is another clostridial organism that causes severe nervous system um, disease. Uh, it's something that we can get as well, very dangerous. Um, it can be found in infected feed or hay. So if you have an animal death in the hay loft and they infect the feed uh, with um, botulism, your horse could, could potentially die from it. It's something that I've started to um, uh, to vaccinate my own own horses with because it's a, a very expensive disease to treat. It's a very inexpensive vaccine. Um, anthrax is a, a highly contagious zoonotic disease um, that we might in some cases have to vaccinate for, but it's a very controlled uh, substance. Rabies, um, there are cases noted in this area, so we do recommend treating for rabies. Uh, the recommendation is yearly for horses. Uh, the um, slight difference in treating large animals with rabies vaccine, they actually get two mils um, versus one mil uh, of the rabies vaccine. And then West Nile virus is uh, something that obviously originated in the West Nile region of Africa, but it's actually in this area. It does cause encephalitis and it's actually recommended as a core vaccine in this area. Parasite control in horses is a little bit different uh, than parasite control in small animals. Because we don't typically bring our horses into the house, um, it's not bad for them to have a small amount of parasites. It increases their immune system um, and allows them to um, fight larger loads of parasites more effectively. So we do want to deworm, but usually want to deworm like once a year in the fall. Um, and, other t and only deworm if it's absolutely necessary. So to determine if it's necessary, we want to do a few egg count. And this is a slide um, that has a very specific volume of um, fluid that allows in this one area and has a grid. This allows us to, to quantify or count exactly how many eggs are in a volume of fluid. And that will give us a, a reasonable number to understand um, what how much uh, parasite load are, this animal has. They're, they're going to have some type of parasite load. That's okay. We want them to have a low parasite load. Um, if we have a higher than normal parasite load, they're going to recommend that we go ahead and deworm them. We can deworm them with a, a paste uh, that comes in a tube or a feed additive that we put in their feed. Dental care for horses is important because they're, they have hypsodont teeth. Uh, hypsodont, uh, their teeth, um, uh, they have um, teeth that are, they first they have deciduous teeth, those, those are teeth that fall out like baby teeth, but then our, their permanent teeth are continuously erupting. They're not growing new teeth, they're uh, one big tooth in their jaw that is continuously coming out of the gum line as they're chewing down. Now the problem is that they don't chew things down evenly on, on each side or don't always. And so it's really important that we have a, a dentist or a, a veterinarian come and take a look at the mouth of the horse make sure that they don't have any points from in uh, uneven wear on the teeth um, because when they have little points on their teeth it can cut their tongue and their cheeks and cause them not to want to eat and cause infections within the mouth. We want to make sure that they have uh, no infections in their uh, tooth roots that are going to cause issues. Um, so we want to do that every year, every two years, and do a, a procedure called floating the teeth wherein the um, practitioner will actually uh, file down those points on the teeth and make it more comfortable uh, for the horse. Hoof care is very, very important as well. This is a fat little body on teeny tiny feet. Um, they're basically standing on their middle finger on each foot. Um, so it's really important that you work with a farrier. In some cases, um, a veterinarian will be advising them if we have issues. We want to make sure that uh, they are trimmed at least every six to eight weeks and that we're cleaning them out regularly. Um, they're standing in all sorts of muck, and if we're not cleaning them out, getting uh, stones out or uh, fecal material out, you can get infections or bruises in there. Nutrition, uh, typically our foundation is pasture or hay, and if they were wild horses, that's pretty much all they would be able to eat. Um, we have a lot of problems uh, related to nutritional issues, and that would be laminitis. So those uh, little hooves get swollen in between the hoof and the bone and cause major issues there. It's very painful. Colic is where they have abdominal pain because they're eating the wrong thing. Ulcers uh, will also cause them to be painful uh, in their stomach. So we want to encourage a proper diet. You do need to remember the different types of hay that are available. There is 
Timothy hay, orchard grass, alfalfa, alfalfa grass mix or alfalfa timothy mix, and brome. Brome is a little bit starchier, a little bit more insoluble fibers. Timothy uh, hay, alfalfa hay contain legumes, uh, a little bit more protein, a little bit more carbohydrate. Um, Timothy is probably, and orchard grass is probably the best mix for most horses. If you have a horse that has difficulty gaining weight or is a young horse and needs a little bit more calcium phosphorus in their diet, alfalfa is the way to go. Um, so we want to pay attention to the type. And if you look very carefully at these little grasses, you will see differences. So look at these differences. In the Timothy hay, you're going to see these long legumes. Uh, these long worm-like things, these are legumes. In the orchard grass, you're not going to really see that. You're going to see long bits of grass, kind of thicker grass. The brome will look wide and thick and, and a bit starchy. Um, alfalfa, you'll see leaves, leaves in here, um, very dark, rich, green uh, leaves in there. So um, they actually smell different too. I can't give you smell-o-vision, but it is important to know the difference between these hay types of hay. Um, you want to encourage the proper diet as well. So if you are needing to supplement, um, there are a, a number of different types of diets that you can give. Um, you can give pellets that are made of timothy or alfalfa or orchard grass. Um, and you can also give pellets that are made with other supplements in. A lot of people stick with sweet feed. A lot of animals like sweet feed, but they have an unusual amount of sugars uh, and some increase in fats in this that may not be appropriate uh, for your animal. So you want to really make sure that the, an the animal is getting the right nutrition. Livestock has to do with herd productivity. Uh, we want to minimize incidence of disease with preventive care. Part of our management includes pasture rotation to limit their exposure to um, to infectious diseases and to parasites, and then management of those um, those animals uh, with management of the pasture as well. Um, that improves the nutrition. Ages and stages refers to the fact that we will group animals based on where they are age-wise, but also what stage they are in the reproductive cycle. Nutrition is extremely important. We've we're going to talk about why that's important uh, in productivity, and then vaccination is important to keep disease. Uh, um, uh, low. For swine, uh, swine humans get. And so it's really, really important to, to uh, follow the disease protocols for swine. Uh, most large swine produ production uh, plants will not allow just anybody into their facility. You have to shower in, shower out, um, wear all clean clothing. You can't work in two different swine facilities. You can only work in one. Even trucks that come into the facility must be um, hosed down before and after they leave. So it's really important to pay attention to that. Piglets at about three to four days of age are all processed um, in order to make sure that they stay healthy uh, as they grow into um, big pigs. And so at about three to four days of age, they come and put them in a little restraint. They dock their tail. Um, they clip their little needle teeth so they don't cause problems with mom. They give them an iron injection. They may actually castrate them at this point. Um, and they will give them what's called an erysipelas vaccination. Erysipelas is a, um, is a disease that causes what's called diamond skin disease. Um, diamond skin, it, it's a dermatologic disease, but also it causes joint problems and heart problems in pets. Um, so they will start um, very early on with an erysipelas vaccination. So that is the one vaccine that I have you remember for pigs. Um, breeding pig care, uh, they do get other routine vaccinations. They do have a quarantine uh, procedure for bringing pigs onto the facility. Um, uh, manure care is really important. Nutrition is really important. Um, management uh, of these pigs, stress management is really important. Um, they're, they don't need to be dewormed if they're indoors all the time. If they never have access, uh, if they've got a clean facility and we have um, uh, pigs that have never had access to parasites, they're not going to have access to parasites. Cattle, from birth to weaning, uh, we have 
uh, pregnant cows are vaccinated uh, only in the neck because uh, that's not uh, it's not expensive meat there. Um, we want to make sure that the calves get high quality colostrum. That's their passive immunity. Uh, we are going to have um, uh, vaccinations given at about weaning time when they t we uh, start feeding them um, not milk. Um, and then uh, the big things to, that we're concerned about with most cattle are respiratory diseases. Um, there are a, a group of respiratory diseases that cause um, problems, especially with uh, cows that are uh, stressed. Um, brucellosis is a um, vaccine that it's a zoonotic uh, disease that is a uh, uh, a sexually transmitted disease. That's another vaccination uh, that that uh, they will get. Dehorning um, happens if it's a if it's a cow. We can disbud them or remove those little growth buds. It's a little bit easier to burn off. If they're big like this, we're going to have to dehorn them with um, a large dehorner. Um, uh, withdrawal time uh, is something we have to consider for all vaccines and medications. So anytime we give them a medication, whether it's orally or injecting, we have to keep that in mind uh, because we cannot butcher or use milk from those animals during that time. Here's an example of a vaccine guide for uh, cattle. Um, there are a number of bacterial diseases and viral diseases uh, that we would recommend uh, for um, uh, these animals. Um, here's a number of different brands of combination vaccines. Here's some single uh, vaccines that are available. You see anthrax, bot uh, botulism, uh, spongiform, um, encephalitis, um, a number of different things and, and the uh, vaccines uh, that they get uh, or the viruses that they get or bacteria that they get. So uh, when you're looking for certain um, vaccines, for instance, you might do multiclos, which gets a lot of the clostridial diseases, um, and uh, bovalis corat, which gets four different of the respiratory viral diseases. So those would be two really simple ones to give, um, but you may have to give a number of other vaccines as well. So take a look at that, get an understanding of the different diseases we would be doing. Breeding cattle, um, bull care is different from cow care. Um, bull care, typically we will be making sure that if we're using them as a breeding animal, that they are sexually um, uh, available and able to um, produce more calves. Um, and we have to treat them, uh, with, make sure that they are uh, free of diseases that they could transmit to the cows. Cow care, uh, we're a little bit more careful with cows as far as their uh, vaccines and their management uh, because they need to be healthy to produce calves. Um, mastitis is one of the biggest problems that we come across um, with uh, both beef and dairy cattle um, because uh, with beef cattle, they have to have uh, good mammary glands in order to provide uh, growth uh, for their calves. Uh, mastitis can be infectious or it can be environmental. So if we can keep the environment clean and keep them from spreading disease from um, animal to animal, we can keep mastitis under control. Hoof care is, very, is as important for um, cows as it is for horses. So making sure that we're doing our trimming um, and taking care of their uh, hoof uh, as, as much as possible. Farm, they should go through a quarantine period. Small ruminants, uh, animal care. Uh, first of all, vaccinations of pregnant ewes and does will be uh, C, D, and T. These are, cl again, clostridial bacteria, um, strains C, D, and then tetanus. And that's the main vaccine that we're going to be giving to these guys. There are some other vaccines, but that is the core. Um, the lambs and the uh, uh, kids get protection through colostrum, so we want to make sure they do get colostrum when they're born. Um, and then they uh, sometimes are, are separated from mom and raised, bottle raised, um, but often are raised by the mom. Um, we will need to dock their tails. Uh, sheep need their tails docked. If we don't dock their tails, we have to be very careful about keeping it clean because a lot of times what will happen is that they will poop on their tail. It will get mad. Uh, they will get a lot of other stuff uh, caught in it and it will become a major issue uh, for infection. So docking the tail, there are a number of different ways of docking. There's an electrical, uh, electric docker, There's um, a, we can use a scalpel, use a knife. Uh, we can band uh, the tail, which I don't like because it causes necrosis of the tail and it can uh, lead to disease. 
um, and gangrene. Um, we also are going to castrate um, males uh, typically and uh, and then also uh, so we can use an emasculator and a lastrator for that. Uh, we can use a scalpel, which is uh, my preferred method, or, or using a scalpel and emasculator, um, and a masculatome, which is a burdizo. Um, so there are a number of different ways of doing that. And then parasite control. We do need to deworm these guys. Um, typically, we use fenbendazole, which is called Panicure as well. Um, vaccination, they should get rabies as well if they're pets. Uh, we um, do not see a lot of parasite pro uh, uh, problems if we are rotating pasture, um, but we do want to use some parasite control me uh, measures. So if you think of the life cycle of sheepworms, they're going to lay eggs in the pasture, and then if the weather is suitable, the larvae is going to hatch out, and then they're going to migrate from the dung pellets into the pasture, and they're going to be eaten by the sheep, and then in about three weeks, they're going to develop into um, larvae again. So we typically want to deworm uh, twice, once every three weeks, and make sure that we've gotten uh, taken care of any active infections. If you have any questions, I know it's a lot of information, go through it species at a time and get a really good idea of what you can do to keep those pets healthy.